the Pirates vs. Ninja debate comes to its end at long last, now that the Pirates have teamed up with the clones. It's NES Works Guide In. This week, a patron request from Joseph Adams takes us to one of those unconventional little side stories of the Nintendo Entertainment System. This time, it's a look at the phenomenon of the NES on a chip. Even before the NES arrived in the US, at the end of 1985, the Famicom had become an absolute behemoth in Asia. As we've seen, Nintendo didn't launch Japan's first ever console, but the Famicom found traction there, unlike any home system before it. At the time, Japan enjoyed the unique position of being East Asia's largest and most prosperous economy one that had shifted gears radically after World War II to pattern itself after Western powers like the US and the United Kingdom. As such, Nintendo didn't simply have the distinction of manufacturing the most influential console in Japan, but rather the biggest across Asia. Yet Nintendo didn't have much interest in setting up in neighboring countries like Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South Korea, which were open to Western-style capitalist distribution, but represented comparatively small markets and there existed no real mechanisms at the time for sales and distribution in Asia's closed-up, communist-run superpowers like the USSR and China, meaning Nintendo's interests beyond its native market lay primarily in the US and Europe. But people love video games regardless of the government that runs the show or the economic systems that dictate their lives, and many people who lived in those neglected markets clamored for the same digital experiences that their Japanese and Western counterparts enjoyed. Nintendo wouldn't and sometimes couldn't step in, but that simply created a vacuum ready to be filled with spending cash. And vacuums like that don't remain empty for long. While the Famicom received some limited Asian and Middle Eastern distribution through importers, for the most part those markets went unserved until the late 1980s. According to Super Jump magazine, a Chinese company called Subor created a clone of the Famicom called the Zhao Ba Wang, or Little Tyrant, which quickly became a hit in Chinese territories. One variant even received commercial endorsements by none other than Jackie Chan, who had already appeared in a few licensed Famicom releases. The Famiclone concept spread throughout Asia, with unofficial devices becoming far more pervasive than costly and hard to source legitimate Famicoms. Subor's strategy was quickly adopted by other manufacturers, and one Taiwanese clone, the Micro Genius, made its way into the hands of a Polish importer who decided to create his own local variant, the Pegasus. By 1992, the Fama clone had even made its way into Russia, a country collectively coming to terms with the ramifications of the Soviet Union's collapse. Though uncertainty reigned at the time, so did opportunity. A company called Stiepler imported Taiwanese clones in bulk, and rebranded them under the name Dendi. The Dendi line did extraordinarily well for itself, considering its high cost relative to the modest average Russian income at the time, ultimately selling anywhere between 2 and 6 million units. In fact, while Nintendo claims to have sold roughly 55 million NES and Famicom systems over the platform's nearly 20-year lifetime, the actual market penetration of the platform very possibly ended up being double that once you take into account the literally countless variants of Famiclones. It's impossible to say just how many of the things were sold, given the fly-by-night nature of most of these devices' purveyors, and the constantly evolving nature of the tech. Early Famiclone consoles, like the Little Tyrant, were more or less directly patterned after the innards of the actual Famicom. They typically contained some copy of the system's Ricoh 6502 processor and its discrete subprocessors, like the PPU and sound chips. One of the basic realities of manufacturing is that as the number of components you include in a device grows, the more expensive it becomes to create. In time, sales of Famiclones grew to the point that their manufacturers realized it would be more economical in the long run to streamline the innards of their devices as much as possible, consolidating the functions of the NES hardware into a single board. And thus, the NES on a chip design, in which a single ASIC provided all the functionality of the NES's many disparate components. The CPU, the video processor, the sound processor, and more. The move to a consolidated chip design offered several obvious advantages to clone makers. For starters, as an ASIC, or an application-specific integrated circuit, the NES on a chip design was far more efficient than the original hardware design. Having been purpose-built to play NES games, its instruction sets didn't contain as many superfluous commands. Powering a single chip created around a limited feature set isn't just cheaper to manufacture and assemble, it also costs less to power the entire principle behind mobile device platforms like ARM. 
The move to systems on a chip opened the door for NES handheld devices or other battery-powered gadgets, something the actual Famicom or NES console's innards would be too power-hungry to allow. The move to the NOAC approach also meant the NES clone became its own platform. A Taiwanese company called VR Technology began creating its own offshoots of the NES on a chip in 2001, resulting in an entire suite of chipsets derived from, but not faithful to the Famicom. These range from the VTO2, a stripped-down device with inferior graphical and processing capabilities to the NES, all the way through the VTO9, which bolsters the baseline NES with 32-bit graphics. Perhaps not surprisingly, these developments have created something of an alternate reality of the NES that continues to mutate and develop to this day, one whose unofficial and undocumented nature means we'll probably never see a fully comprehensive history that covers them all. One could be forgiven for the unkind thought that the shift away from a pure Famicom spec is probably best given how poorly the system on a chip design reproduced the actual performance of the NES. While efficient from an energy or business perspective, single-chip reworkings of the NES and Famicom have never really equaled the performance of the real thing. NOAC gadgets frequently suffer from inaccurate music that plays at the wrong speed or pitch, from inadequate support for advanced mapper chips, and even from major display or performance glitches in games that seemingly should work just fine. This tendency was thrown into high relief for many American fans in 2005 when a company called Messiah sold an upscale clone called the Generation Nex. Generation Nex was remarkable for a few reasons, one of which being that it was among the first legally made Famiclones. Nintendo's hardware patents on the Famicom hardware began to expire after 20 years, meaning that any clone created before 2003 either flirted with or blatantly committed patent infringement. Messiah jumped on those lapsed patents right away, producing a slim and reasonably stylish adaptation of the NES hardware that the company claimed would offer an impressive 97% compatibility with the original system's library by making use of the actual NES algorithm. In practice, that 97% turned out to be a rather liberal interpretation of reality. It's possible 97% of games would boot, but many of them displayed obvious defects and shortcomings. In truth, the Generation Nex didn't fare much better than the shoddy clones you could find around that time in shopping mall kiosks or random import shops in your local Chinatown. Its main advantage, at least from the standpoint of legality, was that it only played games from NES cartridges rather than shipping with a load of built-in titles. Ah yes, the built-in games. My recent journey through the early Famicom library on NES Works Gaiden has prompted a constant stream of remarks from people who know these games from pirate cartridges and clone devices. While carts and clones are two different things, their creators typically took a common approach to software curation. Namely, cram as many small ROMs into the built-in memory as possible. Early Famicom games, which ran in the most basic ROM cartridge format and lacked memory paging, were by nature extremely compact in terms of data size. Many NES knockoffs gathered up dozens of these early Famicom titles, without a license of course. Sometimes manufacturers would get ambitious and throw in a couple more advanced games like Contra as a sort of highlight. Far more common was the practice of padding out a release lineup of 15 or 20 unique games with multiple variants of those games listed under new titles. Those variants usually amounted to minor hacks of graphics or gameplay parameters, some of which would actually break the game and render it unplayable. But then I can't imagine someone buying a $25 NES clone shaped like a Nintendo 64 controller that promised to offer 1,001 unique games really expected anything like actual quality. With Famiclones, you sort of instinctively knew what you were getting into. But this practice, too, evolved over time, somewhat in parallel with the unlicensed NES market. Companies like Sachin got their start making shoddy clones of existing games, but gradually attempted bigger, more ambitious things. Likewise, the games that appeared in NOAC devices increasingly diverged from those piles of poorly hacked 1984 Famicom games over time, especially once chipsets like the VR technology VTO3 and VTO7 appeared on the scene. Original games became increasingly common on these platforms. While rarely good, they were at least something different than endless variants of Star Force and Mappy. Where things really get interesting, however, is when you start digging into sanctioned, unofficial NOEC creations. Sometime after the Famicom's patents lapsed, game companies began releasing or licensing their works for release on standalone devices, like the Jack specific classic arcade controller releases that were omnipresent at home goods in the late 2000s and early teens. While many of these devices were ostensibly home arcades, in truth many of them ran on NOAC setups. After all, that spec was omnipresent, affordable, and easy to work with. 
certainly more so than building a custom chipset to run clones for a variety of unique arcade boards. As game historian Frank Cifaldi has found, a great many of these devices simply run NES games, even for games that were never actually released on NES. Namco, for example, has long been fond of peddling arcade games that are in fact the Famicom releases of games like Galaga, Mappy, and Pac-Man. But then there's the case of the Intellivision and Atari plug-and-play devices that don't feature the original console games they purport to, but rather contain remakes for NES hardware. Or the Konami plug-and-play that includes familiar NES ROMs alongside newly made NES versions of arcade classics that never actually appeared on the console, such as Time Pilot and Frogger. All told, Cifaldi believes dozens of these devices featuring new, licensed, NES-spec games exist in the wild. Again, it's difficult to know for certain since none of the companies behind them have made any effort to chronicle their work, let alone publicize its nature. On top of that, these ROMs may be locked permanently to those devices. Most NOAC gadgets use epoxy globs to obscure their CPU, making it borderline impossible for others to copy or transfer the information contained within to other devices. It's a fascinating sidebar to NES history, one for serious digital explorers to dive into. It's also a facet of NES history that seems to be coming to an end. While NES on a chip devices are still being made thanks to the economics of scale, they've largely been supplanted by a cheaper, more versatile device, Raspberry Pi and similar gadgets, which offer the processing capabilities of a modern computer rather than a console from 1983. Many of the current miniature arcade devices on the market are powered by these compact, capable, and incredibly economical gadgets. Using a Raspberry Pi solution opens the door to far more than just NES ROMs and hacks. These systems are capable of running a variety of emulators, many of which exist in open source variants that can simply be loaded onto a device and made to run actual arcade ROMs or 16-bit emulators. Even many consoles for manufacturers like Nintendo and Sega use bespoke versions of this tech. Meanwhile, at the higher end of the market, efforts like the Generation Next, Game Freak, and the Retron family are being replaced by FPGA-based devices which use adaptable physical circuits to duplicate the innards of a given console for hardware-level emulation. Devices like the Analog Mega SG and Retro USB AVS cost more than a system-on-a-chip solution, but for players who want fidelity and playability alongside their accessibility, FPGA consoles are hard to top. Of course, the real takeaway from all of this is that the NES truly is forever. As long as people have access to screens and to controllers, they're going to want to play video games. And that means manufacturers are going to find ways to fill that void, some better than others.